It's like trying to describe what you feel when you're standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon or remembering your first love or the birth of your child. You have to be there to really know what it's like. The Interplanetary Podcast. The exploration of space for the benefit of all mankind. Your hosts here in London, Matthew Russell and Jamie Franklin. Do 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 do. Happy birthday, Jack, Jack Schmidt! Oh, Matt, we were pretty much on time then. At your end, you might have been. At my end, you're about two seconds later. Sure, there's a joke there somewhere. Was that really your best impression of Jack Schmidt? Yeah, I, I, I assume in my mind that's exactly what he sounds like. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, Jack. <laughs> only, only kidding. What a guy, Jack Schmidt. He is a geologist by profession. By profession, in yeah. fact. He's the only professional scientist to have ever left low Earth orbit. Damn. That's nice. The second last person on the moon. Eugene Cernan, of course, being the last. Exactly right, Jamie. And uh, he's, of course, one of the very few remaining moonwalkers. And former US senator from New Mexico. The 12th and second youngest person to set foot on the moon. Oh, my God. Imagine being a moonwalker. An actual one. An actual moonwalker. Harrison Hagen Schmidt is his actual name. Oh, wonder why he changed it to Jack. Well, I thought Jack was normally short for John, isn't it? No. Jack is Jack or, ja- or Jackson. Surely no, Jack's not no, no. short for anything. John. It's John or William. It's, it's short for John or William. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm wrong I'm about not even this, ju- I massively apologise. But that, if that's true, that's ridiculous. I'd like to. Uh, I'm annoyed about that. Hi, I'm uh, I'm William, but um, you know most people call me Jack. So uh, what? Of course, my brother Richard, hmm. he gets called Jack by his friends. Right. But of course, that's a, in in reference to Jack the Lad and Jack Russell. You see, so <laughs> good. Good, good. Let's let's move on from that. But can anyone let me know? Is that is that fake news? <laughs> I call my brother Banjo, though, which is a much longer story. Uh, Jamie, um, yeah. <laughs> also on the 3rd of July is the anniversary of the 10th biggest non-nuclear explosion in Holy all of moly. history. Wow. Well, human-made, I should say. Okay. Non-nuclear explosion. The glorious N1 rocket. Oof. The Russians were trying to build that was similar to, obviously, scale of Saturn V rocket. Mm. And this was on the 3rd of July, 1969. So this was the Russian attempt, really, at their equivalent of the Apollo 8 mission. And this was like... This is... This is the moment of the space race, really. This this attempt is the, is one of the big moments of the space race because mm. America hadn't been to the moon yet, and Russia were really trying to push it. So, um, and the Americans knew it, and so they were all pushing. Mm. And the N one rocket with its thirty engines on the bottom. So this was the sort of big difference between the American approach and the Russian approach. They just had tons of rockets and and the Americans just had five F1s blasting yes. away 30 NK15 rocket uh rocket engines on the bottom and uh, it took off from Baikonur site 110 and everything seemed fine uh but as it cleared the tower suddenly 29 of the 30 engines just shut off and they think it's because a turbo pump had broken and smashed all its parts internally and just shut all the other engines down. One engine inexplicably remained running. You imagine this enormous rocket, N1 rocket. You've seen how big the Saturn V oh, is. Yeah, it's huge. a similar it's similar size to that. Imagine it gets up in the air and then suddenly just pauses and is hanging there in the air, listing over because this one rocket's still yeah, running terrifying. and then starts starts falling to the ground. And then bang and get this it threw debris, this explosion obviously completely destroyed the launch pad, threw debris for six miles away. God. The raging fireball lit up the sky and could be seen 22 miles away in the neighbouring <laughs> town. And, um, and, and this wasn't even the worst-case scenario. 
So this, this is the the tenth biggest explosion, non nuclear explosion of all time, the equivalent of one kiloton of TNT, four terajoules of energy released, but only the first stage had really ignited, and eighty um, percent of the fuel hadn't actually detonated. Oh my god! So, <laughs> what would have happened if eight? You know, it probably would have been the biggest explosion, non nuclear explosion of all time, had the rest of it. Basically, it was RP one, which is a which is a rocket fuel and liquid oxygen. If they'd mixed together and formed this weird gel, and then exploded. It would have just been unbelievably catastrophic as an explosion. Yeah, let's so not try and attempt that anywhere else. N- no, so the launch crew went out 30 minutes after this had happened, and it was still raining RP-1 rocket fuel that had been thrown up into up into the sky and was still coming down as rain. Um, isn't that incredible? God. <laughs> <laughs> it took 18 months to rebuild the launch pad. Then, obviously, the Americans had been to the moon at this point, but, they, the, but the Russians carried on, and they had two more failures of their N1 rocket, at which point they just gave up, which, of course, is just a huge, huge moment in global history, really, because if you think about it, what would have happened if Russia had carried on, had made one of the N1s successful, and and... The Americans wouldn't have abandoned the Saturn V, I don't think, if no. the Russians had an equivalent super heavy lift vehicle. And God knows how that would have changed history. We'd probably have, have moon been bases and things like that. Very different. By now. Yeah. It would have been super different. Of course, Agreed. there was a 20 year old, 20 year old Vladimir Putin who watched and was thinking, I oh, we've lost the space race and us have 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 reigned supreme as the ultimate superpower but i reckon in the future i'll be able to leverage social media and destroy the west (laughs) (laughs) and he was right god damn it oh my goodness yeah what a character ironically though in a little bit of a link here norman earl fagard is a american astronaut born Mm -hmm. on july the 3rd so on his 26th birthday, he would have been completely unaware that the world was changing and that N1 rocket had blown up because it was all secret at the time. Uh, but he would go on to become the first American cosmonaut Oof, because he was yes. the first person ever to fly on a Soyuz yes, mission up was. to uh, uh, the Mir space station on March the 14th, 1995. So... In a way, that was where Russia started to win the space race, in my opinion. Of course, SpaceX may have wrestled it back. So isn't that interesting? God, it's crazy, isn't it? Whoa. What history you've given us? Yeah, July, July the 3rd, probably a very important day in in space history. Very important mm. day. Mm. Well, let's try and make it equally important in the podcast world. Uh, happy July the 3rd, everyone. Yes. Uh, let's make it the Interplanetary Podcast Space Day from this day forth. I like it. It's a national holiday. <laughs> Wherever you are, tell your boss. Just don't bother that, going to work. Yeah, you're allowed to stay from home. Just chill you're out. Absolutely allowed to stay from home. It's, an inter- it's the first international bank holiday. If anyone asks you where the hell you are and why you're not working, just... Point them to us, and we'll um, we'll get you out of trouble. Easy peasy, Batman yeah. squeezy. Go, I'm going to go into a bit of a UK space um, news. Oh, finally! It's an odd one this week. Oh, okay. There's been a couple of news news stories, and they both kind of relate to Brexit. Really, hmm. just at the start of lockdown, you'll remember we we mentioned that OneWeb were going into bankruptcy proceedings. In, uh, or bankruptcy protection proceedings in uh, Chapter 11 in America after launching 74 of their planned 648 satellite constellation for mm. worldwide internet coverage. And, of course, SpaceX have always poo-pooed OneWeb as being too expensive and won't be able to compete with SpaceX, and they might have a point. But since then, it's been trying to find people to buy them out or to help fund the OneWeb uh, space constellation. Mm. And there's been reports floating around that Chinese firms have come in and Utelsat have put in a bid and Telsat and Amazon. 
sniffing around with their mm. Kuiper project might want to sort of uh, barge in. But the most intriguing for us, I suppose, is the UK government have apparently put in a £500 million bid to take a 20% share of part of a larger consortium that uh, includes some uh, equity firms like Unbound uh, and the Indian entrepreneur Shravin Bharti Mittal. Now, mm. Mittal, of course, is a huge industrial family in India, so that should be interesting. Um, and he, and uh, his dad, Shravin's dad, is already heavily invested in OneWeb, so that's so that's more than more reason why that's probably true. Uh, but why on earth are the UK government propping up OneWeb? Mm. Right. So one one reason is that OneWeb is nominally headquartered in London. So obviously it flies with a UK flag. Yeah. Um, but the satellites themselves are built in the US with the help of the Paris French uh, part of Airbus. Mm. So it, it's 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 obviously pretty complicated the international setup. But the controversial and maybe particularly bizarre reason why the UK are interested in OneWeb, the UK government, is, of course, since Brexit, we've been locked out of the military-grade GPS that's supplied by the Galileo system Galileo. that the UK helped help to build and uh, and finance and obviously mm. you can go back to our galileo 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 episode to, to hear do, more about that who could that. forget that yeah it was a great episode and one web they think might provide a solution but there's a whole bunch of articles that came out this week where tech tech experts have been extremely dubious about whether it's even possible saying we've bought the wrong satellites, et cetera, et cetera, citing the orbit heights and the satellite size as being incompatible with GPS-style retrofit, as you like. But I, I think it's actually very, very hard to tease this story away from the kind of normal remoning journalism and and yes. tweeting that everyone – I mean, literally, the tweets about this – they don't make any coherent sense half the mm. time uh, because it's all sort of tied in with the the bitter dispute still going on about Brexit, mm. even yes. even though it's kind of over. It's like, we've just got to deal with it now. Just It's over. Let's just deal with it. Mm. Um, it's, my, it's my philosophy. I know, I know it may be not yours, Jamie, but... Well, like, yeah, it's, it's, I know we do have to deal with it, but I still think we should fight the government to make it as good as it can be. That's where I stand. No, no, absolutely. I think, well, you would have thought that the government would want to make it as good as it can be. It's not in their, it's not really in their interest it. to do the, <laughs> it's not really in their interest yeah. to do it any other way. But, well, we'll see. We'll see. So We'll see. But, but the best case scenario, if we were to steel man it, it might be that Galileo can be retrofitted with a GPS system. Hmm. Uh, a global navigation system and of course that would save the taxpayer because if if uk were to build a galileo replacement all by itself that would cost five billion pounds hmm. so if if we can be part of it and, and it only costs 500 million that's a pretty big saving for the taxpayer it is but of course the us have got every reason to block foreign ownership of us assets due to security concerns so they could block the UK from doing it. Um, but what's in favour of the British, however, the government, is they're part of the Five Eyes intelligence community. So that actually might play in their favour. But, of course, that's in doubt because of our getting in bed with Huawei's 5G infrastructure and all that kind of stuff, which it might yeah. be why there was a little bit of a vault fast on that a few weeks ago. Who knows? It might all be tied into this. It so, yes, be. Uh, they're... Th they're actually bidding as we're speaking right now, so we won't we won't know uh, more details about that story until until the bidding process starts. But yeah, it's it's a it's a really odd one, uh, and of course, well, governments have got terrible track record in tech investments. Like we're just. It's, and I don't think it's just the UK government. I think all, all governments just mm. make awful tech investment decisions. So, but well, we'll see. We'll see what, what we will what, keep how that an eye out. on it. Well, and of course, uh, a lot, lot more obvious actually uh, as to the the court that Brexit being damaging at the moment to the UK economy and to UK space is that this week they announced. Um, the major contracts for the new batch of Copernicus satellites. So, so just as a kind of, 
just to go back a little bit, Copernicus is uh, the Earth observation satellites that uh, ESA run. ESA are kind of like the management. So the European Space Agency managed these Copernicus satellites, but it's actually an EU project. So it's a little bit complicated. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're building six new sentinels, which are the name of the satellites that go up as part of the Earth observation. Of course, they're mm. hugely important. These things are potentially planet-saving devices in terms of wow. knowing what's going on with global warming, et cetera, et cetera. So they really are just insanely important satellites. You know, it's 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 major major stuff. Um, but the long the long story short is that. Um, the EU have uh, ESA have announced and EU have announced who the major contracts are going to, and it's all the sort of usual satellite builders. But this time, does not include any UK um, satellite builders. That is so it's, it's so it goes to Germany, Spain, France, and Italy, mm. and of course they are the, the the four biggest investors in ESA. But one of the problems they think has been that. All the time, uh, the UK isn't in the EU and haven't negotiated properly yet about what the terms when they leave. Um, all the sort of industrial partners around the continent are a bit worried that if the UK suddenly can't actually take part in what is an EU project properly, then it will disrupt the whole thing. So they've kind of left the UK out. And this all comes down to, you know, the the the... UK negotiating what's known as a third country agreement to be part of EU programs like this, which is no reason to say that we shouldn't be able to do that. But all the time the negotiations are up in the air, it's like, well, all the industrial partners can't be sure that it's happening. And so it's kind of, that's been really damaging to lose out on those really big contracts because the yeah, UK is the fifth. Well, they're the fifth biggest investor. So they put so the UK alone put 170 million euros in and we've got nowhere near that amount of money back out. So that's a disaster mm. in the first place. Um but apparently it might not even be Brexit really because we were supposed to put 280 million euros in. But at the last minute, that changed, and they think it might be because the government were, were sort of saying, well, this is an EU project. Why are we putting so much money into an EU project when we might not be in the EU? But mm. it's a kind of chicken and egg situation is because we really don't want to be left out of this project. Because of course not. You, don't want, you, you, cannot, you cannot have like these massive um, satellite, Earth observation satellites, without international um, collaboration. You know, it has to be done at a kind of EU scale. And unless we're part of that, we'll lose this massive bit of industry that we're really good at. You know, we're really, really good at remote sensing in terms of the way that we handle the data and, and, the, and the, the actual machinery that, that does it. All of that stuff Britain is amazing at and, and we make a lot of money from it. And uh, we could be kind of shut out unless we, we're able to negotiate this. Uh, a little bit better so that's that's actually pretty bad news there is some light at the end of the tunnel in the fact that there's a whole bunch of contracts still that are things like building the batteries and things like that for all these satellites that might go the uk's way and that will cover the investment that we put in and a little bit more hopefully so we'll get some return on well on, that'll on be a silver lining but let's hope that we can sort that out eh? yeah so yeah that's it's 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 an odd one. So yeah, two two Brexit I kind of guess related stories about satellites and 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 the UK and what might happen. So uh, ni neither uh, neither are particularly great news for for the UK. But hey, but hey, well, let's see what's let's see how it all kind of pans out. And remember, we might get locked out of a few EU projects, but maybe Brexit will open us up to work with work with other countries in a in a closer way. So it, it's a maybe it's a long term thing. I'm never I'm never the one I'm always the one to steal man an argument, as you know, Jamie. You really are. And I back you yes. every every sentence on that. Ah, oh, thanks, Jamie. It's all right. Um here's a brilliant one. So the Spodcat sent me this on Discord and I oh, absolutely guys, yeah. love this. So Amy Glazier hmm. has written a paper with her friends 
<laughs> colleagues around the world. Right. Um, and it, the paper is called Every Scope and K2 Constraints on Trappist 1 Super Flare Occurrence and Planetary Habitability. Every scope yes. you take. Do you, I, I've never seen every scope before, but I've been looking at pictures of it and it's really cool. So every I scope need to Google is. It. Yeah, you you do. Every scope is is this kind of dome that looks like a a, a a fly's compound eye, and it's made up of twenty four telescopes strapped together in a fiberglass dome. But really, they're more like twenty four kick ass uh, DSLRs with with these awesome South Korean lenses on them and Uber CCD sensors, and so it's a full it's a full sky gigapixel telescope wow. so it looks at it so it looks at the entire sky and can take gigapixel pictures of the entire sky and k2 of course is the kepler satellites uh, the kepler satellite isn't quite as functional as it used to be because its gyroscopes have, have not worked Hunter. properly and of course it you know the kepler satellite uh, revealed most of the exoplanets that we know of uh, but now in its second light phase it's doing a slightly different job and mm. uh, Amy Glazer and her pals have been looking closely at the data from Everyscope and K2 at the solar flares coming from TRAPPIST-1, the host star of the TRAPPIST-1 system, of course. And, of course, TRAPPIST-1, as we know, and we dealt with this on the podcast at the time, is this super exciting extra extra solar system, exo-solar system, with several Earth-sized planets that are just about the right orbit to have liquid water on the surface. Wow. So quite yes. really close and really fun to think about how awesome it was. I mean, there was that brilliant fact about if you if you were uh, intelligent life on one of the planets, you if you developed the telescope, you would see life on one of the other planets before you'd before you'd actually invented the technology to sail round to the other half of your planet. Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> in, in other words, Ga- Galileo was looking at the moon before uh, people had discovered Australia. So yes, it, you know, yes, so yes. You, you've got that kind of thing that that some of these planets are so close together, you, you you'd be able to use telescopes to see cities on the other ones. And Shout out to stuff Australia. Like that. Do we have any fans in Australia? We got a spod cat right there. With one of the major spod cats. But anyway, Jamie, do you want to know what the results of this search are? Because it's all about oh, habit. Yeah. It's all about habitability. Now, I've, I'm going to give you a choice. Do you want the good news or the bad news? Always start with the bad news, please. You want the bad news? Okay. Yes. Well, the flares that come off this this, and you'll like, of course, it's an ultra cool dwarf. I can relate. They're quite angry. Yeah, even sometimes. though they're small, and yeah. they kick off quite a few flares. It's like Joe Pesci. Yeah, it is a bit. They are like the Joe Pesci of, of stars. But it's the wrong kind of UV radiation, apparently. So it's not. So the type of UV radiation that is that is kind of relevant to prebiotic chemistry, in other words, mm. that the UV radiation that will catalyze chemical pathways that lead to things like RNA synthesis and stuff, it doesn't look as though there's enough of it to actually do that job. So that's bad news for habitability in terms of the pathways of biology on Earth. Mm. In other words, TRAPPIST-1 planets yeah. don't experience anything like the UVB radiation that Earth has at any time in its history. So right. um, it, it looks like you know that, that's, that's not great news for... Um, for for habitability of the trappist one planets but of course there might be lots of other pathways to genetic material who knows yes um do you want the good news though oh please so the super flare rate the amount of times that this this ultra cool dwarf gets angry is actually not sufficient enough to deplete the atmospheres of the planets to to wipe away the ozone etc cetera, etc cetera. so it looks like these planets will maintain an atmosphere. So, yeah, that which is obviously great news oh, for life. Thank God. I love a happy ending. No, well, it, you know, in the future, this might be the first human exoplanet settlement. Who I've knows? always said that. I've always said that, me. 
do, do you want another story about how rare Earth is? Yeah, go on then. It's the chiral puzzle of life by oh. Nomi Globus and Roger D. Blandford. Wow. I'm sure we've had Roger D. Blandford papers on quite a few times. Yeah, I um, and and the background to this is um, life on Earth has made a choice to be right-handed, and I don't mean right-handed like you and you and I are right-handed. Mm. Are you right-handed, Jamie? I you am, are, yes. Right? yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, no, what I actually mean is this thing called chirality. Have you heard of chirality? I can't say I have. So a left-handed glove is the same as a right-handed glove in the mirror. Agreed? Agreed. But in real life, of course, a left-handed glove is very different to a right-handed glove. They, yes. They do, a, they do a slightly different job. And it's the same with DNA and RNA. If you think about the way that the helix winds up, it can go to the left like a, you know, like a staircase going to the left or it'll go to the right like a staircase. Hmm. Um, uh, but they would look the same in the mirror, this left and right chirality. And it turns out that life chooses right-handed chirality, that, that all life on Earth is, right, is made up of right-handed DNA and proteins and RNA, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And... Most people uh, up until now have sort of said that that's a kind of random choice. It just so happened that when life got going, it was made of the right-handed stuff, and that's it. That's crazy. Yeah. Louis Pasteur, actually, back in 1860, had this quote. He said, yeah, This is uh, one of the links between life on Earth and the cosmos. <laughs> nice. And uh, and he's not far wrong, you know, because this paper seems to suggest that there is actually a cosmic origin. Wow. It's worth pointing out that chirality is actually one of those things that that really is fascinating. For example, when you make drugs, if you artificially make things like that, they they end up being a mix of the two chiral modes, left and right. Most of the time is fine, but sometimes you get side effects. And of course, uh, remember thalidomide. Mm. Uh, that's a naturally occurring drug within the body, so it always was thought to be safe. But And it was used on pregnant women to help them with the morning sickness. And yes. then, of course, there was loads of terrible birth defects that happened over mm. that period when it was um, prescribed. And, you know, and there's lots of people living with those birth defects to this day. Yeah. Uh, and that, that is down to chirality. It, uh, thalidomide, the, the one chiral side of it is fine, and the other side gives you this, um, this terrible side effect. Mm. And it's the same with food. If you made food using the, the wrong chiral proteins, for example, you, you wouldn't actually be able to absorb it, so it would have no nutritional value. So you'd be eating a beef burger going, oh, this is nice, and then it turns out that it, it just – passes straight through you with, with no nutrition whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, it's quite important. So is it indeed random that uh, life chose to be right-handed? And um, it may not be, and it also may be universal across the universe that, that cosmic rays are coming in and playing a role in the way that, that um, life kickstarts and chooses its chirality. Wow. So, that is nuts. Yeah. That's a big question, and it's some- Matt. Yeah, so the cosmic ray hits the planet and and something to do with the way that it's magnetically polarised uh, will change how um, these helical biopolymers, as they're known, or the progenitors of RNA and DNA, are actually uh, get their chiral, uh, choose this chiral life form over, over this evolutionary timescale. My dad was left-handed, and I'm right-handed. So does that mean that I'm I'm very I'm, I'm more in tune to the universe and than he is? Do no. Do you know Do you know what left-handed and right-handedness isn't even genetic, is it? It's it's a uh, it's chosen in the womb by hormone. And there's actually it's obviously got oh. nothing to do with this type of left-handed and yeah. right-handedness. Um, but it it has there's some interesting things about uh, being left-handed like in in when when there's a violent society you get more births of uh boys in particular who are left-handed really? because it yeah because it actually confers an advantage in fights <laughs> to be left-handed you're a left-handed boxer you've got a massive advantage you it's have. so hard yeah yeah and of course if you're a left-handed swordsman you also have an advantage going up a up a up a chiral staircase um 
But that aside, Jamie, why do cosmic rays have a, a bias, a, a chiral bias? Well, this is really interesting. There so we go. cosmic rays, as we know, are, are, are things like protons that mm. have been, or, or, or atomic nuclei that have been ionized and spat out of things like supernova, uh, supernova explosions and other stupendously violent events out in outer space, basically the most violent place ever. And they yeah. slam into Mother Earth's protective atmosphere. Uh, thank you, Mother Earth, for, for, oh, for looking thanks. after us. The, this atmospheric blanket, which we, we've just discussed, is very, very important. And uh, But what happens is they smash into tiny pieces, and those tiny pieces are pions, and they decay into electrons and muons. But what's interesting about that type of decay is that it's governed by the weak force, one of the sort of known forces of nature. Uh -huh. And the weak force as we discussed on a previous episode, is asymmetric. It's not the same in the mirror. You can't run it backwards and get the same result either. So it's this force that that um, doesn't happen in symmetry at all. Hmm. And that's just one of these bizarre facts of the laws of nature that means as the electrons that are caused by this decay spiral down, they've actually have this slight bias towards a maybe uh, to, to, to nudge things in a particular way. And these, this slight bias basically means that as they come down, they're more likely to knock an electron loose from a right-handed helix than a left-handed one, right? Uh, which causes mutagenesis, which is where you basically mutate the gene of this DNA strand. And of course, mutating yeah. a gene for a DNA is the pathway to evolution. That's how evil is one of the pathways of how evolution actually works. You're mutating this DNA strand. And of course, without evolution, you have stasis and stasis is death. Uh, and so it's even though this, this is absolutely ludicrously um, statistically unlikely. The calculated effect is tiny, a tiny change, orders of millionths of a percent of knocking an electron off a right-handed rather than a left-handed one. But over the vast time periods, that might just be enough to give the right-handed um, right uh, DNA and RNA the kind of evolutionary edge against the left-handed versions. Wow. And so God, that's, that's why nuts. we've been... Yeah, it's absolutely nuts. And uh, what's intriguing is I noticed that astronaut asteroids as well have pre-organics on them that also have this chirality-based uh, bias that's probably caused by the polarization of light doing a similar sort of thing. So, Jeez. but he here's something to sort of that ties in with the Trappist one system as well. And it's, and it's something that I've started to think more and more about is the rare earth hypo hypothesis. Yes. So sort of saying just how special is earth. And if you think about cosmic rays, cosmic rays come in and if, if there's too much of them coming in, they'll destroy mm. life. They'll just smash it to bits and destroy it. Mm. But if there's just right, the Goldilocks, the porridge, just right, it will nudge the, the the DNA into the right in the right direction. It will nudge evolution along, and it just Earth just sits in that sweet spot. It's just in the right place in the solar system, just in the right place in the galaxy. It's got just the right chemical makeup. The atmosphere is just right. The moon is just right to wash the chemicals around, and the list goes on and on and on. And we just live on this incredible planet that's could be so insanely rare it might be the only one which would explain the fermi paradox it's a very good explanation for we the are fermi paradox, definitely indeed. special i mean we are we are super special it just doesn't you bear Matt, thinking about uh <laughs> i mean you you've got to be one of the most special out of all of the specials oh Absolutely, Jamie. That's ridiculous. I, I, I think the special people are the Spodcats out there. Thank you very much, Spodcats. And we for, love you long time. What should what should the listeners do to become a well, Spodcat? Here we go. There is a mythical website which tells you everything you need to know. It tells you about our our merch. Yes, we sell merch. Do you want a t shirt? Do you want a mug? Do you want a wall clock? Well, do you? 
If you want to become a patron and help support this podcast and join the clan on our Discord channel, help put the show together, then head over to www.interplanetary.org.uk. Boom, aluma, aluma. Thank you, Matt. What are you up to uh, this weekend? Anything nice? Um, I shall be watching uh, the Electron launch, hopefully, because there's a there's a oh. UK there's a UK satellite called Faraday One on that, and that's the third of July. So that's today. If you're listening to podcasts as it comes out, and Lovely. and the launch goes ahead. Um, there's also that Falcon Nine launch as well. Another another bunch of Starlinks going up. So oh, you know, it's it's relentless, huge. relentless launching. It really is relentless, Starlink. So, so I should be doing a bit of that. I think actually, that's not until next week. The Starlink. Um, I shall be recording more Queen covers, as you know, Jamie. More that's Queen my, covers. That's, that's, well, that's my, that's my I'm, thing at I'm the going to be attempting uh, to learn some David Bowie songs on my new guitar. I've, I've got a Gretsch guitar now, Matt. Does that make me more special? It does make you very special. What what's the, what model of Gretsch is it, Jamie? Malcolm Young Salute Jet Electric Guitar. Well, it is the Jet, but mine's not called a Jet. Oh, here we go. It's the Streamliner. Ah, uh, yeah, the Streamliner. There we go. Um, that's what I'm going to be doing. Playing about playing four or five chords over and over until I get depressed and I put it down. But nice. You know, I'm, God loves a trier. Yeah. All right, podcasts. Make sure you have a good weekend and you know just look after yourself. Yeah, and enjoy your enjoy your national holiday. Right, that's it. Bye bye, Spot Cats. See you next week for some more fun and games in Spain. See ya. See ya.